I'm Ruth Applehoff, the Executive Director of Guildhall, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the beautiful John Drew Theater in the Dina Merrill Pavilion on this absolutely gorgeous day. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, this is the opening panel of the Shears Hamptons Institute. We are delighted to partner once again with the venerable Roosevelt Institute. Mickey Strauss, our board chair, and Ellen Chesler of the Roosevelt Institute dreamt of bringing an ideas festival to the East End. And four years hence, we continue with their vision, offering top-notch programming featuring leaders in the areas of the arts, media, education, politics, and the economy. This year is certainly no exception, and we are honored to host another impressive lineup of thought leaders. I would like to express our gratitude to uh, to George Yates, and a member of the Guildhall Board of Trustees, and our lead sponsors, Chubb Group and their cornerstone agent, Dayton Ritz and Osborne, and the Hamptons Institute Fellows for their ongoing and generous support. Also our thanks to the actively engaged audiences that we have, that we have now and have had in the, in the past. Our first panel will be led by Jacqueline Adams, former CBS news correspondent and amongst the panelists, I am delighted to say features one of East Hampton's leaders in education, Priscilla Campbell. Without further ado, please welcome Jackie Adams and Innovations in Education. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you. Uh, I'm going to have the panelists take a seat and uh, We'll get started. I'm in a, I apologize in advance. I'm a little bit handicapped, and if I crumble in pain, you'll forgive me. Oops. <laughs> um, as, uh, as Ruth said, oh, thank you. As Ruth said, my name is Jackie Adams, and um, I attended public schools in Boston. Um, and I've covered education as a network news correspondent. And more recently, I've spent nine years uh, volunteering with seventh graders in a program organized by the Harvard Business School African American Alumni Association in the South Bronx at KIPP Academy, which is the flagship of the uh, KIPP network in New York. Um, and that KIPP network has grown to 145 schools around the country. I'm also on the board of directors of KIPP. And KIPP, just in case you don't know, is, uh, stands for Knowledge is Power Program. Public education, as we can tell from our panel and from your interest here today, is a highly contentious subject. And it's so contentious that your very schools here in East Hampton, East Hampton made the front page of the New York Times uh, on uh, Tuesday of this week. How many of you saw the story or aware of it? Right. And uh, um, as of tomorrow, uh, a week ago, the front page of the Sunday Review of the Times also had a big, big story about the Common Core curriculum. Uh, so we're extraordinarily timely with this discussion today. And um, as you probably gleaned, I went to Harvard Business School, and even the cover story of the alumni magazine has to do with the various uh, MBAs who are now involved in creating education content that's being marketed to teachers and school districts and children. And that subject is going to be one of the things we discuss today. Um, obviously, we want to try to address a lot of very specific issues, but this is a hot topic. And my goal, and I hope your goal for today, is that we generate a light as opposed to heat. Uh, President Obama has called education, education equality, the civil rights issue of our time. And parents, teachers, funders, students, everyone knows, or at least that's my assumption, and we can test that later with the panel, that a competitive United States workforce is, uh, is critical to the economic security and economic future of our country. Innovation has been and will continue to be critically important as the United States strives to close the achievement gap and prepare all students, all students in American schools for a much more technologically driven work workplace. 
Much of that innovation is happening in charter schools, and we have several charter school experts here today on our panel, but we also have experts in public education uh, here, and everybody here is a consumer of education, so we're all involved in this system. Um, I do want to, uh, as a baseline, explain the difference between public schools and charter schools, because I've been surprised as we've been preparing this panel that there is some confusion about that. Uh, how many of you think you know what a charter school is? Oh, that's surprising, so few. Well, a charter school is a public school, but it's operating under a separate charter. There are approximately two million children nationally who are in charter schools, and approximately 600,000 students who are on waiting lists for charters, charter schools. Um, unlike the traditional school districts, however, Charter school operators do not have taxing authority, and therefore they must rely on their operating revenues and private sector fundraising to pay for their programs. Now, this definition is coming from uh, material that's been prepared by Rina Bhatia's organization, uh, LIS. Um, most charter schools have no excuses, um, models. They have high expectations for all children, regardless of their economic or uh, socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, in, general, in general, charter schools have achieved higher than average academic results. They have longer school days, longer school years, fewer union restrictions on the hiring and firing of teachers. They um, have independence in innovating curriculum. And there's a strong focus on classroom management practices. The founder of the KIPP schools, Dave Levin, has said that you need four things to have a really successful school. You need a really strong principal. You need the ability to hire and fire teachers. You have to have a contract, which they have, between all of the parents and the teachers and the individual students that they'll all work together to achieve greatness in the classroom. And the fourth thing, the classroom has to be Las Vegas. It has to be dynamic. It has to be exciting. Kids are not going to sit in rows and memorize the way that we did. Now, all of our panelists, in one way or another, have been involved in innovation. And I'm going to give you an outline of today's activity. I'm going to ask each one, very quickly, one question. Then uh, I'm going to engage their answers as we go into the next portion of the day. I'll introduce them more fully, and we've discussed questions and, to and uh, topics that they want to address. I'm going to try to stick close to time uh, at about uh, 10, uh, 11 11.30. I'm going to open it up to all of you. And then uh, I want to save five minutes at the end for one last thing, and then we'll be done at noon. Sound like a plan? OK, great. So for this lightning round, guys, What's the biggest problem facing public education today? Josh? I was thinking a lot about um, this. Obviously, there's a lot of things that would be very valuable to say, this is the biggest thing. But I think what answer I'm going to give is much more about what I think is underneath all of this, which is schools need to have the autonomy to look at the kids who are sitting in front of them, to look at the community that they're operating in, and to make a school that fits their needs. This idea of one size fits all education or big mandates coming down from a district office to a single school that might be good for that school over there but not good for this school over here is I think one of the fundamental issues that we're facing. We need to customize our schools to fit the needs of the community. That, that's what I would call autonomy. Along with that autonomy needs to come a much uh, increased amount of accountability. So if you want to have the freedom to make the school right for your kids and families, then you have to be held accountable to do that successfully. And I think right now we don't have nearly enough autonomy in our schools. Teachers are not, teachers are the ones best able to figure out what their kids need and their family needs. And they're not the ones who have the, the strongest voice or the ones who are having, are at the decision making table way too often. At the same time, we also don't hold our teachers and our schools nearly accountable enough. If you're not producing for our kids, if you're not teaching at a really high level, if you're not growing and improving, you don't deserve to be in front of our kids. And this I was think that's to be a lightning round. That's it. <laughs> Account autonomy and accountability. Okay, yep. Priscilla. Well, like Josh said, there's so many different reasons that I believe our schools are in trouble, um, and I think the underlying problem 
and in fact, perhaps points to his first point, um, such as the autonomy in schools, is the fact that we have such an unequal access to education in America. And I think from that inequality has risen the chart of school movement because they have tried to address and created schools that are autonomous and that teachers can do just as he described. In America, children are coming to school in poverty. They're coming to school without food. They're coming to school ill-prepared to learn. And the schools don't have, in many districts, in many states, do not have the funds to be able to provide everything. So poverty, I think, is the underlying um, condition yeah. that has created inequality. We're going to delve in a lot of those, into a lot of those areas. Uh, Rena? I'll try to keep it lightning. <laughs> um, I think <laughs> I would reiterate a little bit of what Josh um, mentioned in, in his uh, answer. I think one of the biggest issues that we're facing is that we're not kid-focused enough. And I think um, we're worried much more about the adults in the system. And I think that that's what just changing the, the kid focus to kids. Um. And Khalil? Um, I, th I think I'll go back to your first point, uh, Jackie, which is that we're operating in an international uh, in an in international competition for who is going to come out as, a, as one of the supreme countries of the world. We're in a very good position to start. But everyone knows that our education system drives a lot of that, uh, our ability to innovate as a country. What I see as one of the larger problems for education is the ability or inability to absorb new innovations. So we know the research tells us that a teacher is most important in the classroom for a child's development, that a principal is most important, above that a superintendent. But outside of the ecosystem of education, there's an innovation, innovation is happening all the time. And uh, we are having trouble as a country of allowing ourselves to absorb that innovation, those new tools, that new technology in the teaching of children. It's happening in a lot of wonderful places, including KIPP, uh, but it's very tough to do to, to equalize things for every student. Thank you. I'm going to go back, and now that you've heard how brilliant they are to start out with, I'm going to let you know who they are. Let's start with Priscilla, who is one of your local rock stars. Priscilla is a 22-year veteran classroom teacher in East Hampton High School, and she currently teaches advanced placement economics and advanced placement human geography. And if you walk around town with her, everybody was her student. And everybody loves her, so uh, we're, we're very happy to have her here. She's also president of the East Hampton Teachers Association, and she's been that for the past 16 years, and she's the chairperson of the Long Island President's Council. She uh, is originally from Kingston, Jamaica. She um, got a BA, as she came to the United States to attend college and earned a BA in geography from Columbia University, and later a master's from NYU. So Priscilla, what did you think of the New York Times piece? Um, how have the demographic changes, here, even here in East Hampton, that the Times piece echoed, uh, impact your ability to operate in the classroom? How is that reflected in the issue that you raised about unequal access uh, to quality education? Well, specifically to the article which dealt with the East Hampton School District, um, we have seen um, Num the numbers change drastically, as the article referred to. 20 years ago, 25 years ago, there were less than 5% of um, English as second language learners in our district. Now, um, district-wide, it's about 48%. Wow. Well, certainly at the kindergarten level, um, the elementary level, we're up to 48%. Um, whose children come from households that speak another language, primarily Spanish. Um, so you look at a school district that has gone through a change like that in 20 years, and you have to take into account what does that district have to do to be able to be what Khalil referred to as a global competitor, and at the same time um, prepare kids for our local 
and um, state um, requirements. And that is a very difficult task. Um, we've been very fortunate in East Hampton because we've had very supportive taxpayers. Our school budgets have passed, um, not without an incredible amount of effort um, by educating our, our taxpayers, by our superintendent. Why don't taxpayers understand that their future is wrapped up in the future of the kids that you're teaching? Well, you'd, uh, that question is so difficult to answer because this, that's, the, uh, that's America, you know. Um, I think people send their children to school expecting their, the school to teach them. But what happens after school is a big part of a child's education. And um, if you go back to my original remark about poverty, there we have so many parents who are working 20 hours a day. Their children go home to watch television. Children go home to hang out with friends, um, to sit on Twitter and all the various different social network. Um, and this is their stimulus. Their stimulus is not talking with their parents. It's not um, being, being um, they're reading books. They are being fed information from all different sources. And so that's, that's the East Hampton story. And we've done a very good job. Our results show this. Our results show this. We've done a very good job. What's the, the high school graduation rate, roughly? Mm -hmm. Um, it's over 90 percent. Oh, great. Oh, yeah. That's well quite over unusual. Yeah. Yes. Um, but if you look at a state and a national issue, um, this is not the case. No. This is not the case. And um, we can do better as a country um, with our second language learners. And we have to do better because immigration is part of the American story. Um, but how does that happen? It happens by school districts having the means to be able to provide um, adequate, meaningful professional development for teachers on an ongoing basis. And this is just not for teachers who are directly employed in the English as a Second Language program, but teachers across the spectrum. And we are fortunate in East Hampton that we have had we have had um, professional development at all levels, ongoing. Our district, our, man, our administration has been very receptive to what the teachers have asked for. Sometimes things are slow in coming because of budgetary issues, but eventually it does happen. Uh, but this is not the case in a lot of districts. It's not the case across this, uh, the country. And, um, we are going to be worse off for it. And of course, the statistics show. Yeah. Josh, I'm going to move to you. Um, Josh Zoya is a buddy. He is the superintendent of KIPP NYC, and he's the founder of the KIPP schools in Lynn, Massachusetts. He grew up in Marblehead, Massachusetts. He went to the University of Pennsylvania. He lived on a sailboat uh, and traveled the world for a year. He joined Teach for America. He uh, taught fourth grade in the South Bronx for two years, and then he joined the school where I volunteer now, KIPP Academy in uh, the South Bronx. And I think you said your first couple of years were sort of wasted because you didn't know what you were doing, and fortunately the kids taught you a lot. He, uh, became, he uh, entered the uh, KIPP Leadership Fellowship Program and trained to become a principal and bring KIPP back to Massachusetts. He was the founding principal of KIPP Academy in Lynn, Massachusetts, served as the principal for six years. In 2010, he became the executive director of uh, KIPP Academy Lynn as it began its expansion in Massachusetts. And uh, now he has, uh, for the last year, has become the superintendent in New York City and he lives in Harlem with two kids. And uh, they have, uh, your wife has grown up on Long Island, uh, in, uh, close by, not quite in East Hampton, but uh, so he's almost, in, he's a native by marriage. Um, Josh, you talked a lot about uh, the lack of autonomy and accountability in schools. But one of the things that, and, and I, I granted I have an insider perspective, one of the things that I've been tremendously impressed about uh, learning about KIPP being involved is the kind of innovations that you've brought to uh, character education. And, 
and ca can you describe that a little bit? Because um, I think character education may be one of the ways that teachers, school systems can overcome some of those socioeconomic divides. Sure. I think, you know, for a long time, folks believe that character doesn't belong in the realm of education. Like, who is the job of the parent? And I couldn't agree with that more. At the same time, our job is always to supplement what's going on at home and sometimes what's not going on at home. And so we are, we believe, we have a shirt that says, you know, school, 51% character, 49% academics. Ultimately, if you, don't have a, if you don't have strong character, you could be the brightest person in the world with the best education. You're not going to have a life of choice and really have a positive impact on the world. And if you're a really strong character and you don't have any of the tools you need to, to move things in this world, you're not going to have the success, the freedom, the ability to really contribute positively. So those things have to go hand in hand. So and how do you teach and how yeah, do you Yeah, we're unapologetic character. about it first. Well, we teach, we teach character like we teach anything, which is very, very systematically. So one, you have to set structures in your school where you are measuring character, promoting character, you know, stuff like that. So for example, we have things like uh, trips, end of the year trips. So if you do take care of your business during the year, you get to go on a trip. One of the trips we take is out to Utah with, our, with all of our kids for those who earn it. They have to earn it, and I'll get to that in a second. So if they earn the trip to Utah, they get to go out, and we spend two weeks hiking, camping, rock climbing, white water rafting, all that stuff out in a place. Many of our kids have never flown before. Never, many of our kids have never been outside the city before. And you go out there, and every single day is an incredible challenge for them. They're scared every single day, whether it's riding the horse for the first time, or white water rafting for the first time, or being on a rock climbing wall and looking down 80 feet, and I can't go on, I can't go on, and then you like take one more step. And so those are the moments. You have to create those moments both with special events at the end of the year, but also throughout the day in your classes. So one thing is create the, the moments where you can teach character. Uh, with those kind of experiences. But the other thing is just as importantly is what you do every single day. So if your son or daughter does well, you can say nice job. That's actually pretty not very effective form of feedback. You can say nice job, you showed a lot of grit today. That's a little bit better. Or you can say nice job, you showed a lot of grit today. When you felt, when you got knocked down three times on the field and you got up every single time and kept going, that was a great example of grit. So by being very specific in our feedback, by having very specific things that we're aspiring towards, whether it be zest or grit or perseverance or these different character strengths that we put up all around our walls and we talk about and we teach about and we try to live and we try to read about in, in novels and we try to take trips and that support those things. But just as importantly is what you do every single day and what comes out of your mouth every time you give feedback to a kid. So I think all those things need to be aligned. So the experiences you have, how you structure your schedule, your day, how you teach, but also what you do in reaction to what you're seeing every day and how you speak about things. Um, I just want to give you another uh, paragraph or two. Talk about self-control and talk about sense of humor. Those are other character uh, elements. Well, I have to be honest. There's a, there's a, there's a character strength uh, survey that we do, um, and, and self-control is number 24 of, on my list of 24 strengths. So. <laughs> I'm not sure I can speak about it too uh, compellingly from personal experience. But um, those are actually self-control is one of the character strengths shown to be most impactful in your ability to be successful in life. And not just don't eat the extra cookie, but like think about all the temptations that our kids face now more than ever. Think about all the things they face when no one's looking. What do they do when no one's looking? And that's really what self-control is about. Like what, what choices are you making? when no one else is looking but yourself. And so many times, those are the choices that dictate the course of your life. And so we really, you know, we, we promote that a lot. We talk about it a lot. We give them chances to show it and not show it. We give them feedback about it. But self-control is a huge one. And, and, and also humor or joy or fun. So one of the things I love about KIPP schools is it's very strict, definitely, but we have a blast. We're having fun in the beginning of the day, the middle of the day, throughout the day, having fun in your classes. When you teach, you have to be joy teach joyfully with enthusiasm. You have to have a good time. These trips that we take, the celebrations that we have, the way that we operate is humor and joy are infused in everything that we do. Because ultimately, if you think about it, what's really the, the purpose of all of this? is to live a fulfilled and in a life full of joy and enjoyment. And if we're doing all this hard work and we're not leading to this moment where people can, our kids can live fulfilled lives of choice, and then why are we doing it? So I think that humor and joy and those things are, are very much at the forefront of how we operate at KIPP as being important. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, you can apply. That's okay. <laughs> Rena, let's uh, go to you. Uh, now, Rena is another buddy. Uh, one of the nice things about being involved here is you get to invite your friends and make new friends. Um, Rena is Vice President of Education Programs at LIS, which is a nonprofit a lot of you may know about. It's called Local Initiative Support Corporation. It provides low cost financing options for school construction, um, freeing up more funds for the classroom. Uh, Rena spent the majority of her finance career with Prudential Financial, structuring non-traditional social investments, including those for charter schools, and serving as a researcher in uh, Prudential Securities Equity Research Department. She uh, holds an MBA from NYU. Um, Rena, um, you talked a good bit about needing to be more kid friendly, but your day job is making sure that low cost financing is available for schools, particularly charter schools, to be able to have great buildings, to reduce the costs of operating the school so that there can be more money for the classroom. Um, how do you, it, t tell us a little bit about why that's important. It's an area, you know, school operation that most people don't think about when they think about education. So charter schools do not get um, facility financing. They don't get funding for facilities. And it's something that, um, it, it's a policy issue. There are no public funds for, for facilities for charter schools. Um, what we do is provide low cost financing um, where there isn't very much availability in terms of conventional lenders, the bond market, they're not really prepared to make loans to charter schools because they don't really understand them. And they're a very um, risky credit. They're perceived to be a very risky credit. Uh, an organization like my, my, the one that I work for, Local Initiative Support Corporation, we, as a strategy, are focused on community development um, from a very comprehensive perspective. So. Um, education being a very strong piece of that. Um, we also build affordable housing. Um, we, we try to make our streets safe. Um, so sort of the wraparound services that, that, um, that are needed in a community as, as good places to live, work, um, and raise kids. Um, so one of the things that um, charter schools have to deal with, and in, in New York City, we're, we're lucky to not have to deal with this issue um, is it's because um, schools are charter schools are co-located within public building public district buildings, um, but around the country that's not the case. And one of the biggest issues um, that Priscilla also mentioned was um, equality around the country around funding per child. Um, in California, it tends to be five to six thousand dollars per child. In New York City, it's fifteen thousand dollars per child, um, and within that budget schools have to figure out what to do about their facilities. Um, so 15 to 20 percent of, of an operating budget could possibly go to facility financing or just paying for rent, paying, paying their leases, paying um, things that the district buildings don't have to, to pay for. Um, so one of the, uh, to close, our, our goal is to try to finance and help very high quality charter schools like KIPP New York City around the country. And so this is, um, in terms of a from a mission perspective, we, we try to focus on high quality schools around the country. Just one follow-up question, because it's something that I know that LIS cares deeply about. Um, what's the importance of a high quality school building in a low income neighborhood on the entire neighborhood? I, again, why should taxpayers who don't live in that particular zip code care about whether there's a, a great building mm -hmm. in that zip code? Yeah, and, it, and, and that's an issue that comes up in a lot of our communities because we work in distressed neighborhoods around the country. Um, you could have a, an empty school building that turns into blight. It's a place where, um, you know, it's crime ridden, kids are hanging out, it's, it's on off hours. We tend to take a lot of these buildings and turn them into um, a place where the community can gather, um, and, and, I, and I think an example of this is Kip Lynn and, and where Josh, um, what, what Josh founded in, in, in Lynn, Massachusetts. Um, there's, there's so much that can be done with a building that, that you know, it, the, the surrounding community just benefits from having a building that, that is serving children and families, um, whereas the opposite is just, it's, you know, it can turn, it can really turn the community around. 
Josh, do you want to jump in? How did the, the funding in Lynn imp impact the community? Sure. So, I mean, we built a, a new building in a neighborhood that had more foreclosed properties than anywhere else in Massachusetts. It's a community that has been at the, on the heel of, of, of that area for so long. And now this school is open until 10 o'clock at night every night. We run English classes, computer classes, GED classes, all sorts of adult education. It's open to the community. And our, fe our feeling is, why would we ever close our school at 3 o'clock? That's insanity. Like, these are our best community centers. And so by having a building that's in this community, a brand new building, it's, it's basically providing all these services that, the, that folks didn't have easy access to before. So I think a school can be so much more than a school, if, if that's your view of it. And a new building rejuvenates, it can rejuvenate a community. And just as importantly, if you were there the first day when you watched the families and the kids walk into the building, and they looked up and saw this amazing building that they now were going to get to come to every day, it made them feel like they deserved it. And I think all of our kids deserve to walk into a building that they feel good about. Just think about when you wake up in the morning, you make your hair nice, you put your nice clothes on, and you feel better about yourself when you see something nice looking back at you. Walking into a beautiful school, nothing fancy, but like a nice school, it makes you feel like someone values you, it makes you feel like you're important, it makes you feel like this is something important. And it has a big impact on a school, on a kids, on the family, on the community. And I think it's, had a, it's much more than just what you're learning in the building. It's how it makes you feel when you walk into it. And it makes you feel that someone's paying attention and somebody cares about you because they cared enough to make this happen for your community. I think that's a big part of it. I would just add one thing. And, and I, I, when, when I went to visit Kip Lynn, Josh took me around to all the modular buildings that, um, they were basically trailers. Trailers, we, we call them modulars, it's a nice, nicer name. <laughs> it's a nicer name. They're basically trailers that kids were in and some of them don't have windows and, and to, see the, to see the brightness on kids' faces when they're going into these new buildings, they, they've earned it. They've, they've worked hard and they've earned these buildings and it's, you know, it's something that we, we love being able to provide. Does Wall Street get this? I mean, we, taxpayers, maybe, maybe, maybe not, but does Wall Street get it? Um, so I, I... The bond market. Yeah. I, I'm on sort of that line where I work with Wall Street to try to finance these. All of, a lot of our funding comes from um, Wall Street banks, foundations as well. Um, they, they are starting to get it. it it's, it's, from their perspective, they are, they have to bring back a return. And I think that, that so that's, that's where they're coming from, but what I think um, they're starting to realize is that charter schools are gonna be around. Um, they're good credits. We've, um, we've done a couple of studies that have shown that charter schools as borrowers are strong borrowers. Um, and that's important from a mission perspective for us to be able to show because charter schools need this capital very badly. Um, so yeah, I think they're starting, starting to get it. It's, it's, it's been slow. Charter schools have been around for almost a little bit over 20 years, um, so there's not a whole lot of track record that we can we can look to, uh, but but what we have is is quite strong. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Khalil. Khalil is another buddy. He and I work together on a political uh, effort, which I'll describe in a second. Uh, uh, Khalil is president of Students First, and it's a bipartisan grassroots movement of more than two million members nationwide, focused on changing the legislative and policy landscape for public education in America. And Khalil and I got to know each other because he's formerly the CEO of Americans Elect, that was an effort in the 2012 presidential election cycle to try to put a bipartisan uh, ticket on the ballots in all 50 states. It was a, a fascinating effort, and we could have a whole discussion just about that. Um, uh, Khalil uh, worked on the Deval Patrick campaign in Massachusetts. He holds a BA in political science from Morehouse College and a master's from Harvard's Kennedy School. Um, Khalil, we've talked about school funding. Um, you've talked about technological innovation. You work now, oh, and if you've heard of Schools First, it's because it was founded, uh, Students First, rather, it was founded by Michelle Rhee, who was a very controversial school superintendent in, the, in Washington, D.C., and it's also heavily influenced by Joel Klein, who's a very controversial schools chancellor in New York City. Um, so you deal with school boards and mayors and lawmakers and politicians in general. Um, do they get it or will students first be able to sort of 
force them to get it? And how will understanding the, some of the complexities that we've raised here uh, interface with technological change? So I'll take the first part. Um, when you work with, I noticed there's recognition around Michelle uh, because she is a world changer. And part of the world she changed was, I'm, I'm 45, so we're about the same age. I went to public school in Washington, D.C. And my school, Wilson High School, was in a really great neighborhood and had fallen into disrepair. She was one of the, her efforts in D.C. changed that. Joel Klein changed with Mayor Bloomberg, changed the education landscape in New York, not without controversy, not without a lot of uh, pressure and issues uh, presented to them from the other side. But I think the, the core thing that they dealt with as people who have forceful uh, personalities, approaches, and ability to, to organize and conceptualize a future for education in their areas is that they all ran into brick walls. And the brick walls were around the kind of earthbound realities that Rena talked about, which is that there's a number associated with every child, a pie chart, and you have to divide that pie chart to be able to deliver um, a quality education to each child. In the public school environment, the constraints are, it could be contracts, it could be constituencies that are holding on to what is as opposed to looking forward. It could be, it could be the lack of a contract. New York City hasn't had a, had a school contract in a long time. Um, this takes away the, the ability of governors who really care about education, like the one I worked for, Deval Patrick, uh, or school superintendents, uh, who uh, are operating either in the charter school environment or, or in the public school environment um, uh, and, and chancellors of schools, they don't have the, the room to be able to bring whatever the newest innovation is because the laws and policies are uh, anti-innovation, protecting a status quo, are not looking forward. And without that room, so to answer your question directly, they do get it. It's just that they don't have often all the tools they need uh, because in some states uh, they won't allow a charter school to co-locate with a public school. So that charter school has no option. You can, you can create the most creative environment, you can have the best teachers, you can have a lot of money associated with it. But if there's a cap in the state about how many charter schools can actually exist, which is a very small percentage relative to the public schools, uh, then you're not gonna have an innovation environment. So Students First was created to bring a lot of people together, two million members, together to the fight. We're now in 18 states. And one billion dollars? Uh, well, that, that is Michelle's aspiration. Um, she's raised at this point $150 million for the fight, which is still a good number, uh, and, uh, and brought with her uh, an extraordinary organization of 125 people who, state by state, are looking at laws and policies designing laws and policies that will free up innovators to be able to, to bring innovations into the classroom. So Washington, to go back to Washington, D.C., it spent, it has historically spent the most money on students, but gotten, had the lowest uh, national test scores for those students. The innovations that Michelle and Mayor Fenty tried to bring in were uh, opposed vigorously by constituencies and the negotiation around what should be the best and most innovative environment and creative environment for a child to learn often stalls uh, uh, because the world changers don't have an opportunity to even uh, get off the ground. Um, in terms of technology, what I'm fascinated by is this other group of people. When I, when I started, um, and my wife and I, who's in the audience, we started considering taking this position we asked a lot of friends. I'm, always, I'm that kind of person who asks a lot of people questions about things that I should do, a quality that my wife uh, thought was crazy at the beginning, but has come to appreciate. Um, <laughs> you get as smarter go. as a, as And you know. uh, everybody told me their education story. They told me about the school that they went to. They told me about their challenges in putting their own kids in the kind of school or, or interfacing with uh, either the school system, the school district, or the teacher to be able to get their child the best experience. Um, uh, or they told about their own experience coming through a school and, and how they were transformed in that situation. This is one of those issues that cuts across everything. 
what I'm finding is that people who've made it in other areas tend to want to focus on a few things uh, in terms of deploying ideas and thoughts and, and capital. And one of those areas is, is technology innovation in education. So you find within some of the largest venture capital firms within their portfolio of companies a couple of education plays like Coursera or Khan Academy or something else which is rethinking the way we do education. And the big challenge, just to close, is how are you going to take what those innovators are doing and allow someone like Priscilla to be able to use that within her, her classroom every day? I just want to make sure with definitions, what is Khan Academy? What are some of these innovations? And Priscilla, do you want to jump in here? Because I know you use these techniques. I do. I do. And many of my colleagues do, too. Um, Khalil's. I, I don't know if I misheard you, but somehow it, it seemed that at least what I heard that you relegated innovation and its possibilities to non public to charter schools and not public schools. Not at all. Okay, at that's all. what I thought I heard. But what I will say is that but, I find it very interesting that um, that teachers sometimes are constrained by what they can put in the classroom by a contract that was negotiated away from them? Well, I, I think to the, a large degree you're wrong. I really do. I believe it comes down to money in school districts in terms of the type of technology that they can introduce um, into the school in, in large ways. Um, schools that have more money, um, and you can look at Long Island, um, many of the school districts on Long Island that are very wealthy, School districts have, good, have budgets that pass every year. Their, their students are doing, are excelling, um, are going to the best colleges in America. And your 90% high school graduation rate attests that. Yes, it does. It does. And there are schools on Long Island doing even better than our, our school district. I'm not suggesting we're, we're doing the best. Um, and poverty-stricken school districts like Wyandanche, Amityville, um, they do not have the types of innovation in, in their schools because of funding issues. Um, and so it, it really does come down to what is happening to schools, um, the bottom line as to what is happening with school districts. We have this, this um, you know, every day we're hearing that we're being compared to Finland, we're being compared to Singapore, um, and teachers, in America, um, we, we are the problem. Teachers are the cause. We are the obstacles that are preventing innovation from coming into the schools. We're preventing change from happening because of contracts. It's absolutely absurd. 98% um, of teachers, 98% of teachers in Finland belong to a union. And over 95% of Singaporean teachers belong to a teacher union. And their teacher unions, as the AFT, NYSET, and the NEA, have tried to work with the policymakers but what is in, in the United States. But what has happened, and what is continuing to happen, is that the whole policy debate has taken on this left and right, um, the left and right roads, um, the common core, um, issue now is being touted by the right as a left le as a left leaning um, a left driven agenda to elite to make American education an elitist idea. This is absurd. In Singapore and in Finland, education is not a right or a left issue. It is a culture. It is a culture that people have accepted as something they want for their children, regardless of a political affiliation. And so what has happened is the teachers' union in America has become, um, has become labeled as being leftist and supporting um, ideals that are different from a, another party that may be in power at a different time. This is ridiculous. It is absolutely ridiculous. And we need to move the agenda away from politics in America. And to be honest with you, we need to move it away from this privatization that's going on. Because the privatization movement in America and the, the allocation of public money into private 
basically private enterprises in education is what is, I think, leading to a lot of these, these issues. Um, I think there may be some disagreement on the panel, but let's talk I'm about- I'm sure there is. And in the audience. But let's talk about Khan Academy. Talk about how you are integrating some of these, um, the, this, uh, what is it called? A group, uh, not group They're, learning, block they were learning. Um, essentially, blended they, learning. they were to be 15 minute videos that um, Khan created. I think he started in mathematics, maybe physics. Um, I've used them in my AP economics. Um, I use them to augment my lectures. Um, I use them for ch children who aren't at school so they can get my notes and then listen to the lecture at home. Is there an, a cost? Not at all. It's free. Okay. So any school district, regardless, any school district, could use, Any could adapt teacher it. can use it. I think it exists in chemistry now and the various mathematics um, disciplines. Um, it's, it's excellent. I find it excellent. I've, you have to like everything. I think all good teaching, you have to watch before you show your children so that you know what they're going to be seeing and what you want them to get out of it. It's, it's a very good um, tool, I have found. Um, but it's not exclusive, I don't think, of my teaching. I, I believe it helps to facilitate the learning process for children, but I don't think it's, it would work on its own. Um, and, but I think it's very good. Um, but it is free because it has been funded by the Gates Foundation and other organizations. Khan, I've heard him speak many times in person. Um, twice, and he has he has um, described his history in in this. It's it's quite a wonderful story. But Khalil and Josh, you both have some issues with this move toward blended learning. I don't have any issues with it. I, I mean, ultimately, I mean, ultimately, a computer can't take the place of a teacher. But the way we use it, for example, we have fifth graders coming in all across the spectrum on their levels of ability. Some are at first grade levels, some are at fifth grade levels. We put them in a class together, and you're supposed to teach them all the same thing. And so what Khan Academy has done for us is our students who are, have mastered the material that's on grade level are now able to go off and do something above what they would be doing typically if we were all lecturing at, or all working together at the same time. And we've seen incredible um, results, actually it's our first year of, of really using Khan aggressively. And so it's, it's a tool, as Priscilla said, it's a tool to use in your arsenal, and it's a really good one. But we'll never be in a situation where computers will be able to do what teachers. You still need to have a great teacher in every classroom. And we need, yeah, that's, that's the, the foundation of it. And these technolog technological tools are real because they can differentiate for every single kid. So a great computer program is adaptive. So in other words, I, take, I get this problem right, it gives me a harder one. I get it wrong, it gives me an easier one. It can tell exactly where, what I understand, what I don't understand. It can spit out reports to teachers to say, oh, this is how Josh is doing, he's struggling with this. Khan Academy gives all these progress reports and shows you where every single kid in your class has mastered something or not mastered it. So it's a tool to use, but it really does allow each kid to get some time where they are getting material on the level that they're at. And that's very difficult to do with 30 plus kids in your class with one, one teacher in front. So I think it, it plays a very good role, but it's a, it's a role, not the primary role. And Khalil, your worry about these tools? Uh, I don't have any worries about these tools. Uh, what uh, I think that, that one of the things that someone like Michelle would think about or thought about when she was chancellor and the reason why she created Students First is that the resource argument is actually not, uh, is, is not quite the way uh, we've talked about it here today. Uh, the United States spends a lot of money and has traditionally spent a lot of money on education. And we still find ourselves very low uh, in terms of rankings of our students relative to other countries that some of them spend less. Um, and in a place like Washington DC where I grew up, it basically you're spending amongst the highest amounts per pupil of any, any place, yet you're still getting low scores. Uh, what uh, Michelle, I think, tried to do in Washington and what Students First tries to, to give uh, lawmakers and innovators around the country the ability to do um, is uh, create a new relationship with teachers to elevate the teachers so that young teachers aren't the first ones with enthusiasm, aren't the first ones to get washed out when the inevitable budget crunch comes. Uh, 
New York went through a really hard and difficult process uh, because there was no uh, a new teacher evaluation system. And Students First was in the position of working with the mayor and with, with the governor to be able to make sure that that was implemented so that you can see uh, where teachers are, are ranked because they are the most important part of the equation. Uh, but what Joel and what Michelle will tell you is that they were unarmed in the fight uh, on, on a certain level because all of the conversation was aggregated on one side of the ball. And it was the side of the ball that was, uh, in more cases than not, uh, maintaining what was as opposed to allowing really aggressive innovation to happen within uh, the school districts that they were running. And so Students First wants to give that tool and also bring parents, teachers, students to the argument with lawmakers who want to make change in terms of policies want to give them tool by having an advocacy organization that is as large and as forceful um, as, as what is already in place. I promise, oh, Rena, do you want to jump in? I wanted to go back to the blended learning um, idea for, for a second. Um, and it's, this is, you'll see a range between um, the virtual schools that are, the online schools that are coming out and, and there's a lot of controversy around those um, because there isn't a teacher at the front of the room and there is no brick or, and mortar uh, that a, a child has to go, you know, and have that social interaction. And then there are the blended learning models where um, going back to the, the cost per pupil idea, they're being seen as operating very efficiently because they're able to sort of take the cost of, um, the, the brick and mortar down a little bit by having teachers aides in uh, computer labs working with kids versus having a teacher in every classroom. So there's this four hour, four hour sort of blended um, learning model that's really, really, it's done really well in places like California and San Jose where you're only getting $5,000 a kid. Where it's, and, and you're, you're seeing graduation rates at the, the, or proficiency rates in the 90s and then you're getting $22,000 per kid in Newark, and you've got one of the worst proficiency rates in the country. Um, so it's kind of, it's, it, and then, and, you know, when you talk about funding being in, unequal around the country, that's, that's inequality that you can't, you can't um, argue against, but you're seeing vastly different results, and it's, it's pretty amazing. I just wanted to test one, fact that I think I know, one of the reasons why Finland and probably Singapore do so much better is that their populations are more hom homogeneous than uh, in the United States. Is that one of the reasons well, that you see for is, the differences in the source? It is, but it isn't. Finland has a huge immigrant um, population now. Areas around Helsinki are, are, have Ethiopian, Somalian immigrants in large numbers. Um, in, in fact, one of the articles I read most recently um, said that there were over 42 native languages in the suburb, er, the areas around fin, um, Helsinki. So they, I mean, they're a small population as a country. They're five million people, um, but they have a national um, education plan. They have a national curriculum. They have a lot of what the United States, maybe by virtue of our size, is unable to have. But they do have a lot of, of um, they have a lot of practices that we certainly could and perhaps should emulate. Um, certainly if we're going to compare ourselves to them. And that's what I say to these policy makers. If we're going to compare ourselves to Singapore and Finland, then let's do what they're doing. And this is not what happens in America. We have the federal government that says, okay, we have um, the flavor of the year is the No Child Left Behind Act. Um, and states won't get funding if they don't implement certain, they won't get certain funds if they don't implement certain procedures. So in New York State, one of the procedures was to revamp the assessment of teachers. So of course, we got on board with that. Our state decided we don't want to lose our NCL be fun, so we're going to revamp the APPR, which is the assessment for teachers. Um, 
process? Well, there isn't a teacher that will tell you that the APPR makes much sense. There isn't a teacher, but we've done it. We've done it because the state wants to get the money from the federal government. So the government at all levels, national, state, um, is in the business of giving monies and taking away monies if school districts meet certain benchmarks. It's That's an, sort of life, isn't it? Um, it is, but how do you do that with children in a process, in a very organic process? This is not, we're not making motor cars. We are not creating things that um, you can say I mean, the times that teachers do get a lot of credit is in Newtown, when they shield their children from being killed, when they, you know, hustle them um, quickly into safe houses when a tornado is coming. We're doing a great job then, but we're not doing a great job when, we can't, when they can't find the standardized tests that we don't compare equally to Finland and Singapore, but we haven't been given. The system doesn't compare to Singapore and Finland. In Finland, one should know, the children are fed at school. The children receive medical attention at school. The teachers, the teachers come out of a system where the top 10 or 15 percent of graduating classes enter the teacher profession. So the teacher profession is, in, is essentially on par with doctors and other professions in that country. That's not the case in the United right, States. Right. So we, there's, there's so many things here. I'm not here defending teachers per se. I'm saying that we have a system that doesn't function like Finland. It's not created like Finland and we need to take some of what Finland has, adapt it here, and then we, we can be more, um, we can look at those comparisons more realistically. Before I open it up to the audience, Jack, Josh, can I, I have one thing? Brain, I <laughs> I'm like, brain no, I mean, I actually don't disagree with a lot of what you said, but there is a fundamental thing that I think we shouldn't skip, which is, it's not just, it's a mentality issue as well. And I just want, from my perspective, I was spit at, heckled, harassed at rotary events, I was barred from going into buildings in, our, in Lynn, Massachusetts by teachers. I was told by the superintendent, do not go near any of my schools. We created a partnership with one of the principals and that principal got in trouble because we were working together on how to fix and develop our mutual math curriculums. We were seen as, we were treated like second class citizens because we were going outside the system. And so I just, I think it's very important. This is not just about more money. This is not just about better policy. This is about putting kids first and the adults putting their issues to be second behind the issues of the children and changing the way they think and being open to doing things differently. Even if it's harder for them, even if it means more work, even if it means more time, even if it means getting, you know, changing the way they do things. So there is a lot of stuff that I'm hearing I agree with, but we can't forget that this is also about looking at ourselves in the mirror and saying every single day when I go to work, am I doing what's best for kids first? And yeah, making sure our mentality is aligned behind that. And I, I think that there is an increasing constituency that is focused in that way, which is, which is kid focused and trying to facilitate a process where the, the, the adult issues are being put a little bit behind and we're focused on the kids. I also think of it from uh, because I've worked with a lot of politicians and mainly those who decide they want to be governor. I don't know why, but that's, that's been my journey. And they're always very excited. They have these incredible policy groups. They're well thought through and education is, is a part of their book of business that they want to attack. And they go in and they find that the pension system in their state is unfunded. And so the pie of opportunity that they think they have um, is pushed to the back the opportunity they, they want to attack is pushed to the back. There is some alleviation of that with some creative things like race to the top and other things, but that's a temporary solution. Uh, we can only borrow so much money to, to fund race to the top grants um, over time. And so our organization has been, uh, is, is sitting uh, at the table with folks who are trying to figure out how to help governors and legislatures figure this out because we know that if a pension system is completely unfunded and more and more money current dollars have to go into that particular system. That's money that's not landing in the classroom, classroom. to help right. kids. 
$1.5 million of our $4.5 million budget goes to funding our pension system in New York, and with any individual school at KIPP NYC. That's, that's just crazy. I mean, and, and teachers deserve to get their pension, don't get me wrong, that's not what I'm saying, but just understand what that means. When we think about, oh, every school's getting $15,000 per student in New York City, nearly a third of that money is going to fund a pension system. So we have to be more, there's, there's policy issues that have to change, there's a lot that's changed, there's mentality issues, but we have to also get to the, some of these fundamental things underneath are eroding our ability to have the money that we need to do the things that need to be that's done. That's exactly it. I wanted to make sure that you and the audience had a chance to talk. Would you talk a little bit about KFET, this uh, quantifying what makes a great teacher and your uh, willingness to share those findings? Sure, no problem. I mean, I think the key to, to, to all this is, is that our teachers are the most important factor here in developing great learning in our, with our kids. And so we have to then really systematically develop our teachers. That's, it's not about evaluating our teachers, it's about developing our teachers. And where the system's gone wrong, it's because we have an evaluative focus. So at KIPP, every teacher gets su supported, coached. One, Veterans, once every other week, they'll have someone come in and observe their class and give them feedback. So that's 20 observations a year. In a new teacher, it'll be every week. And so we ought, and then we do weekly professional development, we have coaching, we have a very robust set of supports for our teachers. Because that's how you're gonna get better results for your kids, is by having more effective teachers in the classroom. One of the things that we've done is we've worked really hard to develop what does it mean to, to teach well? Like what are the components of good teaching? We've created something we call KIPP Framework for Excellent Teaching, and everyone knows it. All of our development is supported around it. Our, our professional development is supported around it. It's something that we share out with the world. And I think that's where charter schools have a value add. Um, there's a lot of value adds, but one of them is that we, can, we have the freedom to do some things that maybe is more difficult to do in a, in a district school, and uh, we can then share those things out with other people who are interested and might benefit from it. So I think that's... But developing your teachers is really the heart and soul of what needs to happen to improve outcomes for kids. And treating them with respect and as professionals who are growing and getting better is really the way we do that. My name is Jack quickly, Corner. Quickly, quickly, quickly. Real, real quick, from the Montauk School. Uh, your question about uh, ESL students and do we value that. The Montauk School has taken a, a position now. Our ESL students come and leave bilingual. We want all of our students now to leave bilingual. We are increasing our Spanish at the elementary level where they learn language so that all of our eighth graders, no matter where they were born, can speak both English and Spanish. Okay. You are a great audience. Thank you very much.